You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. All right, my dear friends, welcome back to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast and to our Musser Masterclass. As we spoke about last week, last week the topic was there is no extremism in Judaism. But really, it was the laws of good midos. It's the halacha of good midos. Well, guess what? Tonight, we're going to do the laws of good midos, part two. And here we go. We're in the middle of halacha hey in Simon 29 in the Kitzvah Shulchan Aruch, and he brings the following. Le'olam yarbe adam b'shtika. A person should always be in the habit of silence as much as possible. And speak only either words of Torah or of matters necessary for his physical well-being. And even what he needs regarding what is necessary for his physical needs, he should not speak excessively. This reminds me of my grandfather of blessed memory. He was a man who didn't speak that much just to schmooze, to casually chit-chat. There was no light talk with my grandfather. It was, in, in a way, it was a little bit of a very interesting relationship because, you know, most of us may have had grandparents or grandfather. We can talk about cars. We can talk about sports. We can maybe go to a game with them. But yeah, my grandfather never did that, okay? He never went to a sports game, uh, wouldn't know anything about a sports car, or anything of the like. He did have a fabulous sense of humor, but he was a very serious Jew. And he was very focused and didn't waste his words. So if he wanted to say something, he said it. And if he didn't want to say it, he didn't. But he didn't just yammer. He didn't just speak because he wants to be heard or because he wants to pontificate in front of others and try to be all holy and or righteous. Very, very exact with his words. In fact, in his book, Ale Shur, you can see that every word is calculated. Every single word he chose in that book is calculated. Our sages of blessed memory said already, Whoever speaks excessively brings sin to their lives. And we know from the Mishnah, that the Mishnah says that all of my days I have been raised among the sages and I found nothing better for oneself than silence. And Rava stated in the Talmud, what is the meaning of that which is written in Proverbs 18, verse 21? That death and life are in the hands of the tongue. He who seeks life, Belishne, can attain it through his tongue. The Ba'imov is he who seeks death. The Lishnei can attain it through his tongue. We see the dangers of speech. Speech can be a very, very incredible power that can give people life, that can give people encouragement, that can give people hope. But then you have speech that can cause death. You have someone who uses their speech to embarrass another person. That can cause death. A person, you know, in our generation, we have, uh, sadly, episodes of children being bullied, and that can cause them to take their own lives because they see no purpose in living anymore. We have to understand that this is not a suggestion that the halach is telling us. It's telling us very clearly the dangers are real. Our lips Our words have tremendous power, and we need to be very, very cautious about the words that we use, particularly when they involve other people. So the halacha here in halacha 5 is warning us and giving us an opening to recognize, to stop and to pay attention to the power of speech. Again, power of speech can build worlds. Unbelievable. And the power of speech can also destroy worlds. Halacha number six. Different topic. 
Lo yehe adam baal schok vehatalos. A person should not behave with jest and mockery. Don't be a person who's filled with jokes and laughter and just making fun of other people. Velo atzav onon. Nor, on the other hand, should a person be depressed and solemn. Elo samech. Rather, a person should be cheerful. He should be always happy. Kachar mezuchon alarochaz. Our rabbis told us of blessed memory. Schok vekalus rosh margilinus adam erva. Jesting and levity accustom a man to immorality. And as we learned this morning in our Parsha review, that a person needs to be very, very careful regarding immorality. And the Torah warns us about it. Different relationships that are listed in this week's Parsha as forbidden. And what brings a person to that lightheadedness? Oh, they were just joking. They were just kidding around. They were just having fun. You got to be very, very careful about that. A person should also not be avaricious, rushing to gather wealth, nor depressed and idle from work. So a person has to have a balance. And we mentioned this last week. There's no extremism in Judaism. What is there? There is balance. Don't be running after money, but don't either sit at home and do nothing. Elo bal ayantova. Rather, he should possess a good eye. Mimaet ba'esek. Limit his business activities. Ve'osik patora and engross himself in Torah study. Ve'oso hameat shuhu chelko yismachbo. And however small his shear in this world is physically, he should be content with it. So, what's if a person only has? whatever he has. And he's looking at all his neighbors and all his friends and look what they have and look what they have and look what they're driving. Look at their type of house. A person will never be happy. A person will always be sad. A person will be perhaps depressed even because he doesn't have what his neighbor has. But a person needs to know that everything that he is supposed to have to fulfill his mission in life is exactly what he has. You have what you need which is why our sages warn us about jealousy. Don't be jealous about what your neighbor has, because if you're jealous about what your neighbor has, that means that you're looking out and you're not looking in. You're looking what they have instead of looking at what you have. So said our sages of blessed memory. Envy, lust, and pride removes a person from this world. And therefore, one must distance oneself from these traits. What are these three traits? Hakina is jealousy. Hatava is lust, someone who can't control their urges. And tava and kavod, which is honor. If someone needs everyone to honor them, their life is not life. Again, it's a life that needs others. It needs the outside to reaffirm their inside. If you have someone who is jealous, again, they're looking out, they're not looking in. And someone who has urges is constantly looking out for things that can fulfill them. But any addiction comes from a void. They're trying to fill a void. They're trying to fill something. It's not that they need something. It's not even that they're running away from something. They're trying to vil- fill a void. And I heard someone who is a professional in this arena, he says that each drug, you can tell by what drug people become addicted to, by what they're lacking from their childhood. Some people are, are, some people are lacking love. Some people are lacking confidence. Some people have, and the drugs that they give them, give them that thrill. The problem is, is that it's fake. So as soon as it disappears, there's a crash and it gets worse and then they need more and then that same vicious cycle repeats itself. But the idea is is here that we need to look internally to see what we have. The greatest gift in the world is right in you. Right in you, within you. You don't don't have to look at your neighbor. You don't have to look at your friend. 
You don't have to be jealous of them. You don't have to desire what they have. You don't even have to desire anybody's acknowledgement. It's right in you. And that's what the halacha reminds us from the Mishnah and ethics of our fathers, that these three things remove a person from this world. Why? Because they're not really living life. It doesn't mean you're going to drop dead, but what it does mean is that you're not maximizing it. Now, I just want to share with you, my grandfather uses this same Mishnah and says brilliantly that these three flaws are the flaws of bad parenting. You want to know why parents ruin their child? Because they're jealous, they're lustful, or they are desiring of honor. How does that work? I'm jealous of my neighbor's kid. Look how he's behaving. Look how he's sitting nicely next to his parents. Look how he is turning out like such a fine young man. How am I going to make my son turn out like a fine young, young man like my neighbor? Oh, you're jealous. Or you want honor. You want people to say, ooh, you're a child. Wow. So I tell my child, when someone comes to the door, you better give them a drink of water so that they sh- they should say, wow, such a well-educated child. Right? You want, you want that honor. You want that recognition. Or if you're lustful, you're desiring something, you're desiring a, either, a, again, a recognition or you're desiring certain things that are not fair to demand of your child. You, I had a friend of mine who was a doctor. He was a neurologist. And I asked him, so how are things going? And he looks at me squarely in the eye and he says, I hate my job. I hate my job. I said, so why are you doing this? He says, because my parents forced me to become a doctor. Say, I prefer being a garbage man than being a doctor. What a sad way to live life. That even though you have a career that earns him a great income, that helps a lot of people, he's miserable. Why his parents were desirous of a certain child having a certain career. So they put it all on their kid. I didn't succeed with that, so I'm going to make you succeed with that. Now you better, even if you don't want to. My parents didn't give me chocolate, so I'm going to overload my kids with chocolate. Right? My parents had too many rules. I'm going to give you no rules. And people go to the opposite extreme. And we have to be very careful about that. We can have another time we can have a class on parenting. Yes, sir. Right, so it could be like this. There's a certain, what keeps people doing what they do after they have enough money and they have whatever they want, they have, you know. So I'll tell you like this. You have to understand that at a certain age, I think it's critical for a person to continue working because it keeps their mind going. It keeps them busy. It keeps them accurate. But the question is, do you work to live or do you live to work? And that's the question we need to ask ourselves. If we're working to live, then let's live also. If we're living to work, we got our priorities messed up. And that's a problem. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, the question that was asked here was about a cousin who's 60, 66 years old that decided he now wants to buy a motorcycle. So I was saying it's not a midlife crisis. Yeah. So I look, but you know, my father, may he live and be well. Uh, rode a motorcycle all my childhood. I remember my father riding a motorcycle to work, from work. Yeah, always. And my father told us, told me particularly, he said, I'll let you do anything in the world that you want, but no motorcycle. No motorcycle. And I remember a friend of mine here in Houston, I was already now in my mid-30s, and I called my father. I said, my friend has a motorcycle, and he offered it to me. I should have bought it. I didn't buy it. But he offered it to me. I said, oh, let me just test it out. Let me see how it drives, how it rides, not drives. And um, I asked my father. I called my father. I said, I'm sitting on the motorcycle, and I, I'm not going to drive it unless you give me permission. You told me I can't ride a motorcycle. So do you give me permission? So he said, okay, just be safe and don't do anything stupid because you only get one chance on a motorcycle. So, um, you know. Thank God I did not buy it. I, 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 I did ride it that evening once or twice. 
and there was more than enough for me. I was like, okay, I, I've, I've had enough. So, so there goes that. But either way, let's go back to our topic here. What Halacha 6 is telling us is that a person needs to look internally. When someone laughs and mocks others, again, they're looking outside of themselves. They're not looking in. That's the danger. Number seven, Shema Yomor Adam. Since envy, lust, pride, and the like constitute an evil way, for they remove a person from this world, I will exceedingly avoid them, and I will distance myself from them to the opposite extreme. To the extent that I will not eat meat, and I will drink wine, and I won't marry a woman, and I won't live in a decent dwelling, and I won't wear decent clothes, but you will dress in sackcloth and the like. This is also the bad way to live life. Why? It's an extremist. And it is forbidden by halacha for one to go that way. Someone who goes in this path is called a sinner. Why is it called a sinner? He's just trying to stay away from temptation, from urges, from envy, from honor seeking. What's the big deal? Why is he considered a sinner? As the verse states, Sharek Siv Nazir, as it is stated regarding the Nazir, Vichiper Olav me Asher Chata al Hanefesh, and he shall bring him atonement for having sinned regarding the person. Our commentaries explain a Nazir whose vow of Nazirus to become a Nazirite prohibits him to drink wine, become Tame to corpse, or cut his hair. Such a person is required when his term of Naziris is complete to bring a number of offerings, including a chatas and an ola, which is a sin offering. The Gemara asks, how did this man sin? What did he do wrong? After all, he just wanted to be more holy. He just wanted to distance himself from the physical pleasures of this world. What's the big deal? Rather, since he deprived himself of wine, he is considered to have sinned against his own self. He's considered a sinner because because he's depriving himself of the pleasures that God gave him. God gave you a, a, a life to live and to enjoy and to derive pleasure. And you're limiting yourself from that pleasure? You have to bring a sin offering for that. So, and the rabbis of blessed memory said, now, if the Nazir, who abstained only from wine, requires to attain forgiveness, one who deprives himself from every single thing, is most certainly called a sinner. Meaning, a person should not be an extremist. The Torah doesn't want you to say, oh, I'm going to be like the priests. I don't get married. I, you know, I don't involve myself in any type of worldly pleasures. I limit what I eat. I limit what I speak. There's an entire village in Israel of Christians that don't talk. They don't talk. No talking. You know what that's called? Extremism called extremism because they want to be holy and the only way to be holy is to not sin with our mouth that's not what the Torah wants us to do the Torah wants us to talk but the Torah wants us to do it with balance balance is the key the Chavetz Chaim they say was not a silent man the Chavetz Chaim was a very talkative person he loved to schmooze but you know what in as much as he wanted to schmooze he was careful not to speak words of slander, not to say words of mockery on another person. In fact, the halach actually says a very interesting thing. The Torah says, it's a verse in the Torah, 
Lo sonu ishesamisecha, you should not cause pain to your fellow man. You know, you say, uh, give your friend a little jab, you cause them pain. That's a biblical prohibition. You say something which isn't nice to your fellow, it's a biblical prohibition. Anything that you say or do that causes your fellow Jew pain is a sin of the Torah. You're not allowed to do that. A person has to be so careful not to cause another, to afflict another person with pain. This the Torah warns us. Lefikach. Therefore, Tzivu Rabbeinu Zechon Levracha, our rabbis of blessed memory, Shelo Yimna Adam Es Atzmo, Elam in Advarim Shatora Asrolano, that a person not deprive himself of anything besides for those things that the Torah already prohibited us. Velo Yesar Al Atzmo Benedorim Uvishvos Tvarim Hamutarim, and he should not invoke vows and oaths to forbid permitted. Things upon himself. This is what our sages tell us of blessed memory. This is in the Yerushalmi, the Talmud. It says, "Lo dayecha masha osra Torah, elo shaata oser alecha dvar mamutarim." Does it not suffice for you that which the Torah prohibited, that you must prohibit upon yourself permitted things? The Torah gave you enough prohibitions. You have 365 prohibitions in the Torah. You have to add more? And that's a, that's a complaint that the heavens has on a person. What? It's not enough what we did for you? You have to add more, more things? More prohibitions? That's nonsense. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Uh, so we, we, we have to understand that the Torah tells us we learned it again today in this week's Parsha, in Parsha Sachrimos. We learned about Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur has five afflictions that the Torah tells us. But it's the only time in the Torah that the Torah <laughs> says, it's the only time in the Torah that it says to afflict yourselves. One time a year. Why? Because these are the things that perhaps brought you to sin. If it being, uh, you know, in, inappropriate marital relations, or if it may have been food, or if it may have been clothes, whatever it may be, those are the five afflictions we have in Yom Kippur. But you're going to start making new things prohibited upon yourself? But the Torah didn't give you enough things that are prohibited. Torah doesn't want us to suffer. The Torah doesn't want us to be limited. The Torah wants us to enjoy. Which is why it's our job to enjoy, but with proper balance. Go out and enjoy. Go eat great foods, but even that is in ba- it must be with balance. Dietitians will tell you, there's no food that you can't eat, but it must be in balance. It must be in balance. It must be with not too much. If you eat too little, you'll be hungry, you'll be starving, can, can hurt your body too but not eating too much. So have it, but have it in moderation. Similarly, the rabbis of blessed memory prohibited that one may not afflict himself with fastings excessively. So we have six fasts in the Jewish calendar. Six, that's it. Right after Rosh Hashanah, we have Tzom Gedalia, the fast of Gedalia. Nine days later, we have Yom Kippur. And then we have Asar Bateves, the 10th of Teves, when the walls of, when, when the city of Jerusalem was under siege. The 17th, the uh, Esther, the fast of Esther, which is number four. We have number five, which is the 17th of Tammuz, which is going to be in two months from now. And then we have the 9th of Av. That's it. Six fasts. One, only one is in the Torah, which is Yom Kippur. The other five are rabbinic by nature. Some more severe, some less severe. But now a person's going to start adding, oh, I sinned, I think I should fast tomorrow. Oh, I want to connect to God, I'm going to fast tomorrow. Rabbis say, no, that's not the proper way. That's not the proper way to connect with the Almighty. Ve'al kol advarim elu 
And with regard to all of these matters and the like, Amr Shlomo Melech Alavashom, King Solomon told us in Ecclesiastes, Al Tihi Tzadik Arbev Al Tishakem Yoser Lema. Oh, Lama Tishomim. Do not be overly righteous or excessively wise. Why be left desolate? The Omar Peles. Can't read this. I'm sorry. Pales Magal Raglecha Bechol Drachecha Yekonu. Weigh the course of your feet, and all your ways will be established. I'll tell you in a second. The verses are instructing us here to balance our actions. You need to have balance and not to go to either extreme. A person who is an extremist is distanced from God. And by the way, extremism on either way. There are people who go in order to connect with godliness. They go out and they roll naked in the snow to be able to make nothing of themselves and that We don't need to do that. That's not, that's not, be normal. Be normal. The halacha says be normal. Don't cause affliction, suffering, pain to your body. Hashem doesn't want us to do that either. Halacha number eight. Kvar kosavnu mamar Yehuda ben Tema. We already previously cited the saying of Rabbi Yehuda ben Tema. Heavy as can a mer, be bold as a leopard to carry out the will of your Father in heaven. Shalo yisbayish bifneodam, that a person should not be embarrassed before other people. Hamal iganalov, who will scoff at him. Bavodas abori yisbarach shmo, with respect to his service of the Creator, may his name be blessed. Aval mikomokom, but nevertheless, lo yane osam divrei azus. So you're walking down the street with your yamaka proudly, and you have a little group of thugs at the corner. I had this, by the way, growing up. Growing up in Brooklyn, we were recipients of a lot of abuse from our Puerto Rican neighbors, African American neighbors, uh, all of the different, uh, you know, Italians. Italians are usually nice to the Jews, but they'd say, Hey, Jew boy. And they would knock off our beanie, right? And they, they were, they were definitely laughing at us. Don't be embarrassed from people that scoff at you, that laugh at you with respect to your service of Hashem. But nevertheless, lo yane osam divri azus. A person should not respond brazenly. Shalo yikne Kinyan Binafsho, in order not to acquire the character trait Leos Azpanim, to be a brazen person. Don't be a brazen person. Don't be back in their face. Oh, I'm gonna show you. Right? Oh. Afilu Shalom Bemakam Avodis Baruch Shmo. Even if he is not involved in the service of Hashem, he should not learn to respond. A person should not be an angry responder. The comment. Someone says a bad comment to you, laugh it off. Absorb it. No need to hit back. What good is going to come out of it? So you teach your son to be stronger. Tell your son that's unacceptable that he said that. Someone says that to my son and calls him a name or sort of laughs at him. So my son, what do you think? What do you think about what he said? Right? It's not nice. Torah tells us not to do that. Not only not nice, it's not true because you're awesome. Just ignore them because they don't deserve your response. And give your child the confidence to stand up and to, you know, (laughs) it's something that we've discussed previously here at the class, but Rabbi El Yashiv was a leading rabbinic authority in Israel passed away a few years ago. He was asked, what, are, what do you tell your child when he gets bullied in school? Just teach him how to punch back. Teach him how to punch back. 
people today are like, oh, just, just, you know, no, 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 no. Give him the power, give him the strength, give him the confidence, give him the, the trust and belief that he can defend himself. He can stand up to those bullies. Now, if it's a dangerous situation where the guy is 18 feet tall and he's this little shorty, he got a problem, right? And then you're going to have to, you might have to get involved in a different way. But generally speaking, a child can stand up for themselves. And a parent should give them the full authority. You got this. And because even if the bully in the, in the class beats the snot out of him, right? He beats him up. He'll still have the ability because he knows my dad believes in me. My mom believes in me. I can do this. Maybe not for this guy. He's a little bit bigger than me, but someone else, no one's going to mess with me. The truth is, most of the times it doesn't have to go to violence. It doesn't have to go. You can use your words properly, nicely, kindly, gently, firmly, if needed. Usually that should be enough. Again, this is not a class on parenting, but parenting definitely does play a significant role in our lives. Halacha number nine. This piece of entertainment has been brought to you by <laughs> Bruce Schimmel Law Firms. <laughs> All right. Halacha number nine. So too a person should not quarrel for the opportunity to perform a mitzvah. Very common. Such as in order to pray before the ark to lead the prayer services or to be called up for the Torah of Ekadoma and the like. Like we find with regard to the Lechem Aponim, the Lechem Aponim, the showbread, were 12 loaves of bread that rested on the Shulchan, on the table in the temple. Every Shabbos, the loaves were removed and divided among the Kohanim and replaced with new loaves. Af shuhu mitzvah although there is a mitzvah to eat it, Shaninu, we learned, Hatsnuin Moshchun Yodehim. Nevertheless, when the Lechem upon him was distributed, the modest Kohanim would withdraw their hands from the Lechem upon him. The Hagargarin, Chotvin, the Ochlin, while the gluttons would grab and eat. You know, I have a couple of comments on this halacha. The first is, you know, we, there's a mitzvah, to recite the Kaddish or to lead the services at a yard site. So if someone's parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, relative passed away on a specific day, then it's a special blessing for the past soul, for the deceased soul, to lead the services and or recite the Kaddish in their memory. And that elevates their soul. It brings blessing to their soul. So let's say the yard site is uh, tomorrow. So tonight already would start Myrif. The guy goes to Davin Myrif. He wants to lead the service at synagogue. Somebody else is already standing. He's like, you know, excuse me, but I have a yard site. He says, so do I. He says, yeah, but you are you have a yard site the whole year, so you can do this every day. But for me, this is just once a year. And they start getting into this whole fight, this whole quarrel. Do you think that that's an elevation for the neshama? Zoom out a little bit and just pay attention. That this would be the worst thing for the neshama that there be a fight, that there be a discord in this world because of them. So a person needs to know and realize. Additionally, we see the same thing. Someone wants to get an aliyah. He says, excuse me. I, uh, right. What is the blessing of the Torah? Thank you, Hashem, for giving us the Torah to have such character traits. To have such bad character traits where we're fighting over who blesses the Torah. That would, that would be a terrible thing. That would be a disgrace for the Torah. But then the last thing he says here is that those who were modest pulled their hands away. Those who were gluttons, they would grab and eat. You know, Kiddush is a very good time to tell people's character. 
Kiddush time in shul. You have the table all set. You have the cakes. You have the cookies. You have the candies. You have all of the yummy, delicious foods. And as soon as they're finished in the, the, the prayers, Shabbos morning, everyone goes out into the Kiddush room. And the rabbi, hopefully they have enough derech eretz, enough proper proper uh, character to know to wait for the rabbi. People don't wait for the rabbi. That's just no basic. That's a basic, not even a courtesy. It's a basic respect. You wait for the rabbi. So they wait for the rabbi. As soon as the rabbi says, Bore Priya Gafin, boom, all the hands are in, grabbing. And many times, sadly, it's even before the rabbi comes in. They're already filling up their plates. They already have their, their eyes all, you know, sparkling and excited for the food that they're about to devour. That's not good. I'll just share with you one quick story. I've mentioned this in the past, but one of my sons, sterling, sterling character. All of my children have great midos. This one particular child demonstrated in the most incredible way. And my children know that this is one of my pet peeves. Kiddush, don't touch the food till after the rabbi finishes Kiddush. You don't touch the food. Don't take a plate, nothing. So it was after I already seen too many cases of inappropriate Kiddush behavior, I spoke about this with my children. I told them that this is unacceptable behavior, and they all understood it. So we were at Kiddush, and my son was all the way at the end of the table, and right in front of him is cut up babka, chocolate babka, and that's the best the best cake you can get at the Kiddush at that time. And it's right in front of him, and people are slowly filing into the room, and he's looking at his plate of of Babka, but he didn't take one. He's sitting right in front of it, waiting for Kiddush to start and finish so that he can get his piece of Babka. And, you know, finally the rabbi comes into the Kiddush room and he finally sits down and he fills up his glass and meanwhile another cake is being taken from in front of his eyes and another cake in front of, and another piece of Babka and now there's like three, four pieces left. Now the finally the rabbi begins the Kiddush. And there's only four pieces left. And I see from the corner of my eye, see my son is like just hoping that nobody takes anything else. So there should be something left for him after Kiddush. So, you know, the rabbi is like, you know, Al Kain Beirach, which is the introduction for the prayer, for the blessing. And another cake is taken. And now there's only three left. And you can see his eyes are a little bit watering. And, you know, Baruch Hata Hashem. And another piece of cake is taken. Borei, and then the last two hands come and take the last two pieces of cake. Pre hagafen, and everyone's like, Amen, l'chaim, and everyone, you know, eats their stuff. And my son is sitting there, like in such devastation that all of his babka was taken from in front of his eyes. And I saw it, and I didn't tell him anything. That afternoon, at the Shabbos meal, in front of all the guests, I said. I want you to know something. I'm going to tell you a story. And I told him this story. I said, and that child was none other, none other than my son, Shlomo. And I said, as a reward, I'm going to pick you up from school Monday. And I'm going to take you to the store. I'm going to buy you an entire babka just for you. An entire cake just for you. So I did that. Monday, I picked him up from school for lunchtime. At lunchtime. And I uh, took him to Randall's and he picked out whichever babka he wanted and it was his. And at the end of the day, and he went back to school, at the end of the day, I asked him, new, so how was the babka? He says, I ended up giving out to all my classmates. So, <laughs> but the the idea here is that we need to train ourselves and definitely we need to train our children to have some self-control. Do you know the self-control that is required when you know that something is wrong, when something should not be done, and you withhold yourself from doing it? The Torah is filled with such opportunities for us to strengthen that muscle. 
An example of that would be my little daughter is five years old. And, you know, when you check out at any of these supermarkets, they have these pressure sales items right in front, like the candies, the gums, the chocolates. So the greatest thing of being kosher observe, kosher eaters is that most of those are not kosher. Many of them are, but most of them are not. And when my daughter says, hey, can I have that chocolate? I'm like, sorry, it's not kosher. And then the question is over. There's no longer a fuss about it because she knows that's a hard stop. There are certain things that are just not. And it's very important for a child to learn that. And it's not because I'm telling her you can't have it because it's not kosher. I just say, oh, it's not kosher. Oh, it's not even a question. Don't bother her. Now, if it was kosher, she might insist and, and want it. And very likely, very likely I would acquiesce to her pressure. But still, it's very important for children to learn that when something is right, great, if you can. And if something is not, it's just not. And when something is wrong, when you see something which is wrong and you're able to point it out to your child and they understand, yes, this is wrong. And no matter what, I have to refrain from it. It's a very, very incredible, hopefully a tool that not only this child, but hopefully all my children will be able to take with them their entire lives to know when something is right, great, do it in the right, in the right fashion. When something is wrong, it's, it's out of the question. So halacha number 10, so it says, the gluttons who grab and eat. The gluttons who grab and eat. I love that. Person needs to be careful also not to grab things. There was once this, this, uh, comedy guy, a Jewish comedy, and he was talking about all the different things that he invented. So one of them was the Kiddush fork. So it was this long fork that extended out that it can go over everybody's heads to get, to get the, but that, that's, it's funny and it's humorous, but it's not funny. Okay. We should learn to be patient and we should also learn that a person shouldn't eat with their eyes, especially when there are other people. What happened about being courteous for other people? You have to take 17 cookies on your plate when nobody else is going to have what, you know. So a person has to think about others and not to always be running after their own desires and urges and uncontrolled temptations for food. Number 10, halacha number 10. Teva ha'odam hu, the nature of a person is liyos nimshach b'masav, to be drawn in his actions achar re'av. After his friends. We're drawn after our friends and his colleagues and the inhabitants of his place. Therefore, a person should endeavor to attach himself to the righteous people. And to constantly sit at the side of the scholars in order to learn from their deeds. And one must distance himself from the wicked, who travel in the darkness, so that he not learn from their terrible ways. There is an undeniable reality, and that is we are, we are influenced by our environment. However you cut that cake, we are influenced by our environment. And a person who thinks that they're not being influenced by their environment, they're missing something. The reality is that we're all being influenced by our environment. If a person is in a place where everyone needs to drive a fancy car, you're going to be influenced by that environment. And that's also a sad thing because if someone isn't able to afford it, they'll have to cheat and they have to steal in order to get to that standard. Or in an environment where people um, drive a certain way, where people drive a certain way. I'll tell you what, Israel is a very aggressive country, and the way they drive, the way they drive is even more aggressive. 
like just add on aggression to aggression. Uh, and unfortunately, when people go to Israel, like th- when was the last time anybody here honked their horn in their car? Once in a while, once a month. Uh, right. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so once in a while. Right. So that, that happens every once in a while. So how long, how, how, how frequent is it? Once a month, once every two months, three months, four months. You understand that in Israel, my mother says, you know, it says that Mashiach is going to come at the bat of an eyelash. She says, you know how quick the bat of an eyelash is? She says, from when the light turns green till the first honk of the horn. That's the bat of an eyelash. They honk in an instant. Now, again, we have to appreciate it with, uh, with love because, you know, time is life. It's not money. Time is life. Life is very precious. So if this guy is just sitting there and not driving, it's, ta- it's my life that's at stake. Okay. That's, let's learn. Let's, let's find favor. Let's find favor in what they're, in, in what they're doing. But the idea here is that a person needs to surround themselves with positive, righteous people. Because when you're around righteous people, you'll act righteously. When you're around wicked people, you'll act wickedly. A person is influenced by their environment. Therefore, distance yourself from the wicked so that you not learn from their ways. Amar Shlom HaMelech HaVashalom, King Solomon, told us, taught us in Proverbs, Holech es chachamim yechkam v'roech silim yoroa. One who walks with the wise will go, will grow wise, but the companion of fools will be broken. Ve'omer ashrei ish. Praiseworthy is the man, praiseworthy is the man who did not walk in the counsel of the wicked and in the path of the sinful did not stand and in the company of scorners did not sit. That's from Psalms 1. Because when we're in the environs, when we're in the environment of people who do good things, we do good things. We're influenced by their positivity. When we're in the environment of people who do negative things, wicked things, we're influenced by the negativity, by the wickedness. And this is a tragic reality. We're seeing this in our generation. How people are being influenced by media that they're choosing to allow into their lives. A lot of these things that are going on today with children, with all of this nonsense, is being influenced by our media. Our media is putting it in. And by the way, it's not only adult media. It's through the children's movies. It's through the children. They're they're instilling it into their subconsciousness where they don't even know, where there's a confusion about what's a male and what's a female, what's a father and what's a mother, what a wholesome family is supposed to look like. They're putting it into our children's books, into their cartoons. So if we allow our children to be influenced by those those things, they will be influenced by those things. And for someone to say, oh, they're little, doesn't make a difference. You better believe it makes a difference. It makes all the difference in the world. Because we're influenced by our environments, and even, even more so with children. It's even worse because children don't have the protective mechanism to push away evil. They don't know right and wrong per se. Yes. Children do have an instinct. They, there's no question that children do, but when they're watching a, 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 a cartoon, but, but when they're watching a cartoon, uh, and it seems very innocuous and it seems very, you know, yeah, Disney. Disney is a perfect example. Right? Where our children are, I'm not saying this to be, you know, sensational. Our children are at risk with Disney. 
Our children are at risk with Disney. I would not let my children watch a Disney movie today. Unless I watched it first, but I probably wouldn't waste my time watching it. So, sorry, that's a no. But, so the old time Disney, right, the old time Disney had a wholesome environment. There was a father, there was a mother, there was a sister, there was a brother. The girl wanted to marry the prince. Yeah, there, was, there was something that was a, a wholesome, proper message. Today, the, that's true. The girl wore a dress. That is also true. But the, 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 it, right, right. But again, okay. So I don't want to get into the politics today. Today it's already politics. It's all that. I think that we have to remember that the Torah gives us very clear specifications of what is normal, what is healthy, and what is not normal and not healthy. And you look in this week's parsha. Look no further than this week's parsha. It tells you exactly what type of relationships are okay, and what type of relationships are absolutely not okay. It's not me saying this. Not my opinion here. This is the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. This is His opinion here. If it's popular or not popular, it's irrelevant. This is what Hashem says as the Creator of heaven and earth. He says this is the right thing, and this is not the right thing. Amr Shlomo Melech Shalom, King Salman. Oh, so we already read that. Sorry. Ve'im hu dar be'ir sheman higeha ro'im. And if one dwells in a city whose leaders are evil, ve'ain anoshe aholchim b'derech yishar, and the inhabitants do not follow the proper path, ye'lech misham, he should leave that city. Lodur be'ir acheres, to live in another city. Sh'anoshe at tzadikim whose inhabitants are righteous, and who conduct themselves in a manner of the upright. You're in an environment that's not good. You know how to change it? Leave. Go to an environment that is good. Halacha 11. Mitzvah lehidabek betalmidei chachamim. There is a positive commandment to be close and to connect to the Torah scholars. Kedei lilun ma'asem, in order to learn from their ways. Ke'inyan shenemar, as the verse states, uvo sidbak, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20, to him you shall cleave. What's to him? To the righteous. Vechi efshar la'odem lidabek b'shechino. Is it possible? How do we know that it's referring to the righteous, to the scholars? Maybe it's referring to the Almighty. So the, the halacha here says, is it possible for a human to cleave to the divine presence? Rather, our sages explained, cleave to the Torah scholars. Therefore, a person must endeavor to marry the daughter of a Torah scholar. Why? Why a daughter of a Torah scholar? Why should a man marry the daughter of a Torah scholar? Because what's been her environment her whole life? Torah. So if that's her environment, that's going to be the environment in your home. And to marry his daughter to a Torah scholar. And to marry, and to marry, I'm oh, sorry, and to eat and to drink with Torah scholars. Velasos prakmati l'talmud chacham and to engage in business on behalf of a Torah scholar. Velehischaber alehem b'chol minei chibur and to attach himself to them in all manners of bonding. Be involved with Torah scholars. Be involved with righteous people. Shenemar uledov kabo and to cleave to him. I will just share with you that we're going to have the opportunity here at the Torch Center and online, of course, at Torch Zoom. And to all of our friends on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, Rabbi Lazer Brody is going to be sitting right here next Thursday at 7.30. He's going to have a lecture here. He's going to be sitting right here. We're going to set it up as the classroom. We'll have all the chairs all around. It's first come, first serve. Get a seat at the table. Um, and those of you here online, you'll get the front row seat right here. But it's going to be a tremendous privilege for him to be here at the Torch Center and to talk to all of us, and to hopefully for us to connect with a righteous scholar. 
And so our rabbis of blessed memory commanded concerning cleaving to Torah scholars. For Amru, and they stated, Sit in the dust of their feet, and drink their words thirstily. So what our sages here are telling us is to connect it, to be close to people who are good, good influences. You want to be connected with good influences. You want to have all around you, you want to have goodness. The more we're able to connect ourselves with positivity, we'll be positive. The more we connect ourselves with negativity, we'll, God forbid, be negative. We don't want that. We want to be connected with the Almighty. We want to be elevated. How do we do that? Be around good people. Learn from good people. Have your children be in in an environment of goodness, a wholesome environment. They're not, they're in a school, they're learning bad things. I'll I'll just share with you one more story. We'll end with this. So. I've shared this story before and I'm embarrassed by it, but it's the reality. It's, it's a, it's a good story anyway. So when I was about 10 years old and I got into a little fight with my brother, my older brother, he's a year and a half older than me, two years older than me. And, uh, something happened and I threw out a name that nobody should ever use. And, uh, my mother was shocked and she's like, what did, what did you just say? You wait for Abba to get home. So sure enough, my father gets home and my father, who is a brilliant educator, did not spank me. He did not give me a potch. He lovingly and calmly sat me on his lap on the front porch of my house. And he said, I'm not upset at you for saying that. I just want to know, where did you learn that from? So what do you mean where I learned that from? Right there across the street. We lived right across from a schoolyard, a public schoolyard in New York City. And that's the way people spoke. They shot a basket and they missed the basket. They threw out a word. Right? If they were playing baseball and they, someone caught their, their pop flight to the outfield, they used that word. That, those were my friends. I knew these guys. These guys are, you know, these guys are my friends. So my father realized that it wasn't my fault. But very soon after that, we moved to Muncie, New York. Because in Muncie, New York, we don't have public schools. We don't have that influence. And it was just a matter of time where those words were never used again. My father explained to me, this is not proper. This is not the way we talk. But you can't blame a child. You put him in an environment and expect him not to be influenced by that environment. So my dear friends, the laws of good meetos, of how to conduct ourselves properly, God willing, we'll be able to continue next week. I look forward. Have a terrific evening. Drive safely. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcast.com.